Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for another informative panel as part of our ongoing technical webinar series. My name is Heather Weitzner with eConcrete, and I'm joined by my colleague, Rachel Krasna. Today, we'll be covering environmental considerations for offshore wind development, specifically focusing on marine environments. We just have a few housekeeping items before we begin. Everyone has entered the webinar on mute. This webinar is being recorded and will be available afterwards. We'll have three presentations, after which we'll have a Q&A session. So without further ado, Rachel will introduce our first speaker. Great, thank you, Heather. So our first speaker today is Andy Lipsky. Andy has over 25 years of fisheries experience. He joined NOAA's Northeast Fisheries Science Center in 2016 and currently serves as the center's acting offshore wind program lead. In this role, he oversees the center's growing offshore wind science program to meet the scientific needs of the regulatory process and advance research on the integrations of offshore wind on NIMS trust resources. Thank you, Andy, for joining us today. And go ahead, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Rachel. I'm gonna share my screen and I would just ask you to confirm that you're able to see it when I do. There we go, share. Yep, it's coming through. All right, thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction, Rachel. I'll just also acknowledge um, a number of contributors to, to the materials I'll be presenting today from the Northeast Fisheries Science Center up in NOAA Fisheries and our Greater Atlantic Regional Fisheries Office um, out of Gloucester. So um, just sort of setting context for this conversation, there are um, fairly large national targets for offshore wind development um, in order to address our global decarbonization efforts. Uh, this slide sort of demonstrates in purple what, where we are. In tar this actually may be a little out of date because these targets are often changing, but you can see our what targets are for 2030 and 2050 uh, by continent. Um, and the green indicates, um, so targets are in purple and the green is what would be necessary to reach the 2000 gigawatt global target. So. Um, there's a lot on the horizon, uh, but what may be off of the horizon is additional needs for offshore wind energy uh, to meet our net zero um, objectives. In the US, um, we have a 30 gigawatt goal by 2030 that the Biden administration has set with a pathway to 110 gigawatts. Um, so we're looking at a, a very large cumulative uh, exponential growth of, of this new industry in marine space. Um, what that means for the 2030 goal is roughly 3,100 new structures. Um, this is in the Northeast region, across the Northwest Atlantic uh, shelf uh, ecosystem and about uh, uh, 10,000 submarine cable miles. The 2050 goal, if we apply this, the same turbine sizing, which may not be a good assumption uh, in the future because turbine sizes and the, and the numbers you need are changing. Um, but if you apply that same amount, the 2050 target, we're talking about 10,000 structures and 33,000 miles of submarine cables. Um, again, that's, the, that's a national goal. So we're looking at a very large footprint, a new footprint, a new area of, of marine infrastructure development that I would argue is probably unparalleled with any other uh, large scale marine development on earth. Um, so we're, we, we're conducting this very large experiment um, by placing structures um, in the ocean. And these structures will have interactions across um, various parts of the, of the ecosystem. Again, we're doing this to address our global climate uh, change targets and needs, but nonetheless, there are uh, interactions when we talk about changing ocean uses and changing ocean spaces where there are existing resources and existing uses in place. So um, offshore wind will interact across the, the uh, full NIMPS uh, uh, portfolio, our trust resources, such our protected species under the Marine Mammal Protection Act or the Endangered Species Act, our habitats uh, that we protect through the essential fish habitat provisions through Magnuson, uh, as well as our managed fisheries. Um, and the other component, which I'll go into a little bit more in depth, is the interactions that offshore wind um, has with the marine ecosystem, but also with our science operations themselves. Next slide. So we see sort of four major science needs uh, from a NOAA fisheries standpoint. There is the uh, re related to offshore wind energy. There is the science and technical support that we provide to the regulatory process. 
There's the uh, research needs to understand the impacts of development on the marine ecosystem in our trust resources, whether it's North Atlantic right whales or the 177 fishing communities in the Northeast region. And the third area of need is mitigating the impacts uh, of wind energy development on our scientific survey enterprise themselves. And the fourth area of need is where we can't avoid or minimize impacts developing effective science-based mitigation approaches, whether it's mitigating impacts or interactions on longstanding fishing communities that are currently using these spaces that may be displaced by offshore wind energy or the potential uh, interactions on trust resources like marine mammals, uh, sea turtles, and other organisms that we're entrusted to conserve. So different structures have different effects. Um, right now, most of the development for uh, 2030, uh, that the existing leases are supporting fixed foundations or monopiles. This generally is in, uh, you know, less than 60 meters in depth. And the, the new horizon, uh, which we've just, uh, as I mentioned before, set some goals for 35 gigawatts, um, 15 gigawatts by 2035 is advancing uh, floating technology, which really um, removes that engineering constraint of water depth to where offshore wind energy structures can be placed. And these different structures have different effects depending on the type of structure. So I have this one sort of uh, large noisy slide that sort of sums up the, the various interactions of offshore wind in, in summary, you know, a, 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 not all of them, but many of them. Um, one of the key areas to understand is that the spatial scale of interactions are beyond the footprint of the development. Some of these impact producing effects are, uh, will be uh, happen quite close to the turbines, such as where we experience and see reef effects. And some of these interactions can be far removed from uh, the, the turbines themselves, such as during construction noise and impact pile driving or potential oceanographic impacts during the operational lifespan of the projects, which can, which can occur up to 70 or even 80 kilometers from, a, from an individual turbine or wind, wind farm area. Um, the, the projects themselves are temporal, happen temporally, pre, you know, they, the, the interactions happen during the pre-construction period, construction period uh, to the operational period, which is a 30 year period to the decommissioning. So we're looking at a sort of a 30 year life cycle of interactions. And uh, whether in many of these interactions with our trust resources may be subtle, individually when looked on their own, but can be more meaningful or have more meaningful interactions when you look at them cumulatively um, in space and time and aggregate. Um, the other thing to consider is these interactions are occurring in the context of existing ecosystem change with warming waters, acidification, and consequent population shifts of organisms and marine uses. So uh, just a, a quick summary of these impact producing effects. We have noise interactions, during the construction, you know, actually during all phases of the, the pre-construction, construction operation and decommissioning phase, electromagnetic net magnetic, magnetic fields, uh, the reef effects, which have been uh, well-documented, uh, benthic and pelagic habitat modification, uh, stepping stone effects through the um, introduction of invasive species as we place these artificial islands um, in areas where there aren't um, structure in the ocean, potential entanglement, a displaced fishing effort, um, either due to operational issues where it will be unsafe to put, um, uh, unsafe or uh, for fishing operations to occur operationally, or in the case of many countries in Europe where those areas are ex excluded from fisheries. Um, contaminants um, from some of the uh, manufa manufacturing fabrication applications um, to the components of, of the turbine footings and then the hydrodynamic wake induced effects. Um, I wanted to focus a little bit on the uh, oceanographic effects because it's, it's actually an area of, of emerging science and emerging research need. So um, there is potential for oceanographic effects from these offshore developments. Um, they're likely to have uh, local effects in the form of increased turbulence, reduced stratification, increased eddies, um, increased water residence time, within wind uh, turbine areas and possibly more local chlorophyll production as seen in the figures below. Um, however, the impacts are likely to be scale dependent uh, with the potential for larger scale regional impacts. And that really stems from the atmospheric energy extraction from 
which from the wind farms themselves. This can result in reduced wind stress and wave energy, wake effects that lead to, uh, to changes in upwelling and downwelling dipoles, um, which can impact tidal dynamics, reduce mixing and reducing uh, uh, boundary layers and shallow mix layers. And what does this mean? Well, it can mean um, uh, various things on the marine ecosystem. When we think about North Atlantic right whales, we're developing offshore wind energy that smack dab in one of the uh, more important areas of habitat for right whales in southern New England. Um, it's the only winter foraging habitat for that animal. So understanding these interactions on circulation patterns and how it could impact zooplankton abundance, density and energy content and distribution is really critical to the conservation and recovery of, of right whales, which is a critically endangered species. Another interaction um, that's near and dear to NOAA is the interactions of wind development on our scientific survey. So in our evaluation, our first commercial scale project, we determined that our surveys would be um, majorly impacted by these projects. And the way that uh, when you look at offshore development um, across where it's proposed in, along where we conduct our long-term surveys, and these surveys are conducted in order for us to, uh, to set quota to support the Magnuson-Stevens Act so we can have um, seafood to eat and also to conserve and recover our protected species. So it's aerial surveys or vessel-based surveys. And the impacts are actuated by basically four mechanisms. One is preclusion, because our large ships or aircraft will not be able to survey uh, following the protocols and safety measures they currently utilize and so will be displaced from these areas. The second is the impacts to our statistical design. And the third, which may be the larger impact, um, is habitat change, whether that change is positive, negative, or neutral. We don't understand how that change affects distribution, abundance, or vital rates inside and outside these wind energy areas, and we'll be introducing bias into our assessments. And fourth is reduced uh, sampling productivity, where uh, we have increased transit time for our vessels to move around wind energy areas, and that can mean loss of sampling. Or in the, in the terms uh, for aircraft operations, if we can't fly below the cloud cover, uh, because we may be inter interfering with the maximum blade height of a turbine, then we have to sample another day. And that's lost uh, aircraft time. So these uh, various impacts, uh, preclusion, statistical design, habitat change, and sampling affect a lot of aspects of how we conduct our surveys. The random design, the timing of our surveys, the patchiness of the uh, populations that we're trying to sample, uh, potential distribution shifts and then in the sampling rates that we're currently sampling and need to change. Um, there is um, various ways that this uh, impacts our customers, such as uh, our fishing communities, because when we introduce uncertainty in our assessments, which are based on our scientific surveys, it basically, when we apply the precautionary approach, it basically can mean we're introducing error, potential error, uh, potential uh, biases in our time series, uh, uh, uncertainty estimates in our biomass or air estimates, and all this um, is will will per percolate through our, our assessment process in terms of uncertainty and applying the precautionary approach that generally means that we'll be lowering harvest limits. So that's not something that we want to do. So the good news is there are solutions for this, and we're about to release uh, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and NIMS is about to release a implementation strategy for mi mitigating the impacts of uh, offshore wind on our scientific surveys. The, the draft strategy was released in the spring, will be finalized in over the next few weeks, but it overlays uh, the goals that we're trying to achieve, an implementation uh, framework, um, how we're gonna work with our partners and about 43 actions uh, that we will carry out and the resources that will be needed um, to implement such a large program. It outlines a sort of a six step framework that starts with evaluating designs, identifying new survey approaches, because these, this, while this is a challenge, it is an opportunity to use new technologies and new approaches to surveying, cal calibrating new approaches with existing ones so we can maintain the integrity of our time series, and then conducting these, this type of monitoring for the lifespan of the operations. And of course, this effort is going to require uh, working to develop new regional data streams and communicating and, and developing um, changes to our surveys and assessment enterprise, working very closely with our partners. We look at, we look, we're looking to um, finishing that survey mitigation 
strategy and like I said, in the next few weeks and implementing it over the next few years. So with that, I'll close and thank you for your attention. Great, thank you, Andy. I know I'm excited to take a look at that strategy when it becomes available. So thank you for that informative presentation. All right, so our next presentation is gonna be with Justin Krebs. Justin is Vice President and Offshore Wind Program Manager with AKRF, an environmental consulting firm based in New York. Justin manages strategic planning and environmental permitting, construction and operation plan development, and environmental impact statement preparation for offshore wind clients. He has 21 years of consulting and research experience in the fields of ecology, underwater acoustics, endangered species consultations, and offshore wind development. Thank you for joining us, Justin. So go ahead and I'm gonna turn it over to you to present. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, get my slides up here. Are you able to see those? Yes. Perfect. Oh, but one second. We see the presenter mode, not the actual slides. Oh, um, okay. Let me try that again. Oops. Okay, yeah. That's better? Yeah. Great. So I'm going to focus this afternoon on the planning and permitting process uh, for offshore wind projects um, and give a relatively high level overview of the environmental considerations that are made at the various stages uh, from BOEM's initial designation of the wind energy areas up through the completion of the permits and approvals that allow the project to be constructed. Uh, a lot of uh, what I'm going to talk about is complementary to what Andy just discussed. Um, and we'll hopefully provide a, a nice foundation for what Carl is going to talk about in a few minutes. Uh, so to provide some context uh, for those that aren't familiar with the offshore wind industry, there are at least two dozen offshore wind projects currently in various stages of development in the, the Mid-Atlantic Bight between Cape Cod and Cape Hatteras. Uh, those wind farms, when they're constructed, uh, as Andy mentioned, will help the U.S. meet its recently mandated goal of 30 gigawatts of offshore wind uh, by 2030. And that transition to cleaner power is obviously a good thing. Um, it will have significant environmental benefits, uh, but as with any development, um, there are environmental considerations that need to be evaluated uh, to minimize the, the impacts uh, to the offshore and coastal environment. The, the placement of wind turbine generators, uh, like you see in the, uh, in the upper right, uh, and the uh, inner array and, and export cables that connect them and deliver the, the power to shore uh, is going to introduce new structures uh, into the environment on the outer continental shelf and in the, the near shore and coastal areas. Uh, and that will inevitably result in changes to the system. So there are numerous opportunities uh, for environmental considerations uh, during the planning and permitting process uh, for, for each of these offshore wind projects. And even before a project begins, it's, it's planning and permitting. Um, the process for offshore wind development in general uh, has been underway in the U.S. for, for well over a decade. Uh, that process started um, with BOEM's evaluation and designation of wind energy areas along the East Coast. Uh, and that process continues off the West Coast in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, in the Central Atlantic, and in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, prior to leasing an area for offshore wind development, BOEM conducts a NEPA review. Uh, to evaluate potential impacts of, um, of leasing those areas for development. Um, that's really the first opportunity to consider the, the potential environmental impacts of, of offshore wind development. Um, then those wind energy areas are subdivided into lease areas, which are auctioned to developers. And during the early planning stages for, for an individual offshore wind project, the developer prepares a number of documents, including a site assessment plan and a construction operations plan, um, the, the site assessment plan or SAP is uh, describing uh, the deployment of a med ocean buoy or tower, which will be used to collect weather and oceanographic data uh, for the project. The construction operations plan really is the major uh, project slash environmental document um, that, uh, that informs the, the environmental review process. It contains all the various aspects of the project design, provides baseline characterization of the affected environment, uh, for the physical, biological, cultural, and social resources, 
um, that exist within that project area uh, and, and might be affected by the project. Uh, as part of both of those documents, there is an evaluation by the developer of uh, potential environmental effects to the natural resources uh, and some discussion of avoidance, minimization, and mitigation measures. Um, uh, oftentimes, the developer will include applicant proposed measures uh, for medi mitigating and, and minimizing and avoiding, uh, and best management practices or BMPs that the developer is willing to commit to um, as part of the activity. Um, the most uh, extensive evaluation of environmental considerations for, for each project happens during the NEPA process, the second kind of the second stage of the NEPA process when uh, BOEM leads the environmental review um, and prepares the, the environmental impact statement or EIS. Uh, that EIS relies largely on the, uh, the project information that is provided by the developer in the COP. Um, and in that EIS, um, there are sections that evaluate potential impacts to physical resources, biological, cultural, and social. Uh, so there's sort of a parallel alignment between the COP document and the EIS, uh, where the EIS um, really does the, the environmental review. Um, each section of the EIS includes discussion of avoidance, minimization, and mitigation measures uh, that the developer has proposed in its COP. Um, but also those that BOEM will require as conditions of approval for the project. Um, and then the EIS contains an appendix uh, that summarizes all of the mitigation measures for the project. So um, there are the environmental considerations and then there are the mitigation measures uh, that, are, um, that are implemented uh, to, uh, you know, to address those, those potential environmental effects. Um, while the NEPA process is underway, the developer prepares and submits permit applications to various agencies, uh, including the air quality permit application for EPA, uh, the Clean Water Act permit uh, with the Army Corps, uh, water quality certification with the state agency, and BOEM prepares uh, the assessments that will support the Endangered Species Act and essential fish habitat consultations with NIMS and US Fish and Wildlife. Um, and each of those documents, the permit applications, the consultation documents, those address these potential environmental impacts. So um, now I'm going to focus on the, the trust resources that uh, NOAA Fisheries or NIMS and uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife are, um, are mandated to uh, conserve and protect. Uh, NIMS um, oversees commercial and recreational fishery species and their essential fish habitats. Uh, the threatened and endangered marine and diadromous species, ones that move back and forth between marine and freshwater, uh, and their designated critical habitats. Uh, marine mammals and sea turtles, coastal and aquatic habitats, including salt marshes and mangroves, uh, national marine sanctuaries, and, and other protected places. Um, Fish and wildlife's jurisdiction is largely uh, on the terrestrial uh, side. Um, they oversee migratory birds, um, bald uh, and golden eagles, terrestrial mammals, including bats, um, threatened and endangered species and critical habitats that, uh, that occur primarily on land. Uh, and wetlands and, and wildlife refuges. So um, when it comes to assessing the uh, potential environmental impacts of an offshore wind project, there are a number of impact producing factors, uh, many of which uh, Andy mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, that are considered as part of the environmental review. Uh, so the, uh, this list here are the, the primary ones. There are uh, several others, um, but these include disturbance and loss of benthic habitat, uh, resuspended sediment and the water quality degradation and burial of organisms associated with that. Uh, the presence of all of these new structures on the outer continental shelf uh, and uh, along the onshore cable corridor and at the, the point of interconnection on land. Um, underwater noise from pile driving vessel traffic and turbine operation, um, both during construction and during operations of the project, uh, and then ultimately decommissioning of the project. Uh, the, um, uh, electromagnetic field uh, and heat produced by the transmission cables, um, increased vessel traffic and vessel anchoring uh, during both construction and operations, intakes and discharges if there is uh, cooling water intake associated with an offshore converter station, uh, and accidental releases, uh, spills of fuel and chemicals uh, and trash and debris. So in the terrestrial realm, many of the, the same impact producing factors are considered. Uh, you've got the noise during construction operation, 
um, lighting, which can cause attraction or displacement of birds and bats. Um, displacement from foraging areas uh, now occupied either by the construction activities or by the operational uh, wind farm. Collisions um, by birds and bats with uh, turbines or other structures. Uh, again, accidental releases, uh, spills and trash and debris. Uh, degradation of air quality. Um, and that comes largely from vessel emissions during construction uh, and to a, a minimal extent from, uh, from vessel activity during operations of the project. Uh, and then finally, land disturbance, um, which you can see in the, the photo down there at the bottom, uh, during onshore cable installation and uh, construction of onshore structures, the substation or the, the onshore converter station. So there are numerous measures uh, that can be implemented to avoid, minimize, and, and mitigate these potential impacts. So I'll just mention a few here. Um, so uh, cable routes can be cited to minimize overlap with sensitive habitats. Um, there are a number of different cable installation techniques that developers will consider uh, trying to figure out the best way to, to install the cable. Some of those are better than others at minimizing bottom disturbance and, and sediment resuspension. Um, using horizontal directional drilling uh, at the cable export cable landfall location will minimize disturbance by installing the cable beneath the habitat uh, and up onto land rather than uh, through that habitat. Silt curtains can be used in sensitive areas, particularly to, um, to control uh, resuspended sediment during bottom disturbing activities. Um, the presence of structures can have, um, can have adverse impacts. Uh, it, they, they can change the, the hydrodynamic circulation of the area, um, but they can also have beneficial uh, effects um, by creating structure uh, in, in a, a, a less structured or unstructured environment. Uh, creates attachment points for, for things to grow on. Um, there are opportunities for um, habitat enhancement and creation. And uh, for, for those of you that are familiar with what eConcrete does, uh, there are a lot of different opportunities and, and different ways that you can, um, that you can build habitat enhancement uh, and, and creation into um, these projects. Um, for noise, uh, um, protected species observers are used to clear the exclusion zone for marine mammals prior to noisy activities like pile driving. Um, noise attenuation can be used uh, during installation of, of turbine foundations uh, to reduce the decibel levels. Um, and a soft start can be used during impact pile driving where lower hammer energy is used initially to let animals clear the area before um, full pile driving begins. Um, for lighting, uh, there are aircraft detection lighting systems, which uh, are used to detect the presence of aircraft in the area and then turn on the lights on the WTGs or the wind turbine generators. Uh, and then after the aircraft has passed, turn, turn the lights off. Uh, so they're not a, a displacement or attraction factor uh, for, for wildlife. Um, light color, uh, rather than using um, continuous uh, bright white lights, um, red FAA lights or flashing yellow marine nav lights can be used um, uh, to serve that purpose while minimizing impacts. And then uh, one example for electromagnetic fields, uh, minimum burial depth uh, for the transmission cable can be used, which puts the, the cable several feet down below the, the seabed uh, and confines, not necessarily confines, but um, uh, basically uh, excludes organisms from uh, from being in the strongest uh, part of the, that field. Uh, with vessels, there are vessel speed restrictions that, that can be applied um, specifically in areas where right whales are, are present uh, and, and at risk of, of vessel collision. Um, midline buoys for anchors to prevent the, the anchor chain from sweeping across benthic habitats and, and disturbing or destroying those. Um, avoiding anchoring in sensitive habitats altogether uh, and use of dynamic positioning systems, which you can see in the, the diagram in the upper right there, uh, which is a, a series of thrusters that the vessels use to maintain position and, and, and uh, move uh, in the water without making contact uh, with the bottom. Um, telemetry monitoring can be used to, uh, to study uh, bird and bat collisions and to monitor for bird and bat collisions with structures and, and hopefully look to better understand that so that those can be um, minimized. Uh, oil spill response plans, and uh, removal of marine debris can be used to minimize accidental spills, trash, and debris. Uh, for air quality degradation, um, 
uh, of course, compliance with the EPA air permit um, is a good way to, to ensure that you're minimizing um, air quality impacts, use of ultra low sulfur fuel and, and clean tier four engines uh, also help to minimize emissions. Uh, for land disturbance, um, if um, transmission cables can be sited in existing right of ways with other utilities, uh, those areas are already disturbed. So you're, you're uh, minimizing your impacts to surrounding undisturbed areas. Uh, you can use soil erosion and sediment control plans uh, to, to control water quality and, and sediment moving into waterways. Uh, and avoidance of removal of mature trees uh, is another way to, to preserve habitat. One, one kind of overarching um, uh, mitigation or minimization um, practice is seasonal work windows. So basically avoiding um, activities that cause impacts during periods when sensitive species are present. So these are just a few of the measures that can be used to address uh, potential impacts uh, from these uh, environmental considerations during the planning and permitting process. Great, uh, thank you so much, Justin. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, thank you for that presentation, that was awesome. Um, all right, so our next speaker is Carl Lebeau. Carl is the New York Ocean Programs Director for the Nature Conservancy. Since 2003, Carl has held several positions in the Nature Conservancy's New York program with a focus on marine conservation and restoration. Carl and his team work on the ecological sustainability of estuarine, ocean, and Great Lakes fisheries, marine habitat restoration, and responsible offshore energy development. So thank you, Carl, for being here today. I see you've already put up your presentation. And by all means, the floor is yours, so take it away. Uh, great. I'm glad you can see my presentation. That's always the... Uh... Um, uh, thing that I want to work very well. Uh, my name is Carl Abu, and I, my colleagues and I, I, do, I lead the Oceans Program for the Nature Conservancy in New York, and my colleagues and I along the coast uh, often get invited to talk about the um, potential impacts of offshore wind development uh, on marine life, and and it makes sense that that we we need to do that uh, when you start to look at the scale of offshore wind development. Um, these are the leases along uh, our coast and my area here in New York. Um, and also recognizing, as Andy said, that these areas are likely to continue to grow as states like New York and New Jersey um, start to even expand their current offshore wind goals. Uh, and I'm also starting to realize that um, it's really important to take a moment at the start to put these, uh, to put all this in context. I'm not going to go through this infographic from the Center for Disease Control, um, but just want to flag that um, it it's to show it as a reminder that the push for offshore wind, which is uh, going to be the largest source of renewable energy in a lot of the East Coast states, certainly in New York, uh, is a consequence of state and federal goals to reduce greenhouse emissions to reduce the impacts of climate change, which are already having serious consequences on human well-being around the globe. Um, and of course, there are strategic um, geopolitical advantages of the U.S. and its allies reducing their reliance on oil and gas imports. And also of note, um, climate change is having real impacts on marine life uh, from a global perspective, from polar bears to coral reefs, uh, but also locally right here in New York. This is a photo of me 23 years ago when I used to work on lobsters, investigating why lobsters were dying in Long Island Sound. Uh, this was eventually linked to warming waters. Uh, this fishery had at the time been the most economically important fishery in New York and Connecticut. Its collapse was a federal fishery disaster with impacts impacting, it's spreading all the way into Southern New England. And sadly, this fishery is not expected to recover. And also a last bit of context, um, I believe uh, when considering all the things we've been discussing so far, we can't lose sight of the concurrent sources of impacts to marine life and marine habitats in our region from human activities like fishing and coastal habitat modification, but also from things that we're just starting to understand like bird flu that's impacting seabirds. Um, not only for comparison of the magnitude and extent of potential impacts compared to offshore wind development, but also in thinking about potential cumulative impacts and for keeping the full range of marine life stressors in mind when constructing impact mitigation menus, thinking about things that we can do 
to reduce marine life impact. Uh, uh, Justin just put up a, a whole bunch of information and kind of alluded to this mitigation hierarchy. And I just wanna take this opportunity to may, maybe put some things um, in, in different spots so people can maybe think what we're talking about when we say avoid or, or mitigate or minimize. Um, really the first step in the mitigation hierarchy is to try to avoid impacts. And um, a lot of that gets done early in the, and upfront by avoiding sensitive areas. And in, in this case, you would, you, a lot of that could get done and does get done in the, um, in the when you selection of leasing areas. Um, and then some more of that can get done in micro siting. Um, and another example of avoidance is, is simply, if your concern is pile driving, selecting foundations uh, that don't require pile driving. You know, that, and that, those kinds of steps are really the kind of a really important first line of, uh, first line of action. Uh, minimizing, just mentioned seasonal construction windows is an example of kind of minimizing impacts. But the next level, um, we talk about mitigation impacts. Again, Justin, I think it was how to slide up on bubble curtains. That's a way to use it, utilizing technology to minimize, uh, uh, to mitigate the impacts of, of another action, which is a pile driving noise. Um, offsets are pretty interesting. They get used on land a lot. You can imagine, um, uh, you know, with land development projects, if you're developing a piece of land uh, and there needs to be an offset, there might be a um, uh, purchasing development rights of a similar piece of land to avoid development of that area. Um, in the ocean, that kind of offset um, it has not been used that widely, but you can potentially imagine um, if you had to reduce, if you're aiming to reduce unavoidable impacts to to certain species, what like what else could you do to reduce other impacts to that same species population or community? Um, it could be something like uh, making investments to reduce entanglement in fishing gear that affects marine mammals, or maybe investments in reducing human caused impacts uh, on sea turtle nesting beaches if the issues are around sea turtles or on seabird rookeries if the issues are around seabirds. What's really interesting is this, this enhancement opportunity. Um, and I think it, it's something that uh, is, is kind of an exciting opportunity in my mind. Um, it's often thought of as a net gain or net positive. One way to look at net positive is, is offsetting extra. Um, but another way to think about it, and I think a, a better way to think about it, a preferred way is to plan from the very beginning when designing projects with benefiting nature as a decision criteria in the design of the project. This could be voluntary. It could be part of a power purchase, project bid evaluation scoring criteria, or it could even be a regulatory stipulation, you know, based on all those, um, that whole list of things that Justin was just talking about through the regulatory side. There's been a global trend in recent years where coastal engineers have been experimenting what's often called uh, nature-based design for hard structures. Many already urbanized waterfronts provide a canvas where there's a lot of potential improvement opportunities in terms of restoring natural habitat values that have been lost in areas when they were initially developed. And this is a space where our team at the Nature Conservancy has made some significant investments on land and in rivers and along coastlines. And we're really exploring the idea of using restoration tools and techniques to make the habitat created when installing offshore wind turbines as productive as possible. We're putting all this material in the water anyway. Can we do such in a way that actually uh, intentionally provides a net gain for fish, ocean health, as well as uh, people like fishermen? Um, the concept of net positive impact uh, is well aligned with dialogue happening in Europe and among several uh, renewable energy developers in trying to simultaneously address the global biodiversity crisis and the global climate crisis. Uh, this is an extension of some of the recent goals and objectives set for project on land. And admittedly, there's still a lot to learn about how to quantify proof of concept uh, and show the durability of these initiatives, particularly in the ocean. Um, while I don't believe that biodiversity per se is the specific performance metric that I would use in temperate marine systems like the Mid-Atlantic, 
There are several other metrics that are available that could be monitored to illuminate positive marine life impacts. And really that's the bottom line we're talking about. While there are likely multiple potential opportunities to achieve net positive impact for marine life, one of the ways that my colleagues and I believe that net positive could be achieved is around the design of underwater structures and associated scour protection at the base of turbines and offshore wind and offshore substation foundations uh, and cable protection. We know that hard complex habitat in the ocean is biologically diverse and important for many species of interest like lobster and cod in New England, black sea bass and pawtog in the mid-Atlantic and snapper and grouper to the south. And we are interested in better understanding how structures introduced by offshore wind development compared to natural habitats. How do we measure that? And essentially, what is the ecosystem effect of wide scale offshore wind build out through project milestones from construction to decommissioning? To begin to look at this, the Nature Conservancy worked with uh, Inspire Environmental to produce this report last year, which was modeled after a similar Dutch report that describes in some of the approaches that could be used to enhance habitat value of scour protection and cable mattressing, and then goes on to catalog some of the available materials, including rough information on cost and availability. Uh, this report is not designed to be an, ex an exhaustive list and new things are, are popping up, uh, nor is it designed to recommend any particular materials. Uh, it's more of a representative uh, uh, sample of examples and the report uh, is linked on our website and it's on this slide here uh, at nature.org backslash turbine reefs. Here's one illustration from the report showing how intentional factoring in the goal of marine, hab marine life habitat creation could influence material selection and design a scour protection aimed at providing greater habitat value than if the cost and engineering efficiency were the only factors considered, which is really the baseline that we're starting with. And I wanna leave you with this final thought. You know, we've learned a lot from decades of observing constructed reefs, shipwrecks, um, offshore energy platforms and their habitat. No, I didn't use the term artificial reefs because I really do question the concept that fish and invertebrates hold greater value or regard for um, you know, piles of boulders that were placed on the seafloor by a glacier as opposed to those dropped by a crane barge. I think where the value comes in is in the location and the type, the size, configuration, and amount of materials and how long they persist. And while there are certainly some unknowns about how, I believe that we'll, with a little investment and some planning around intentional habitat creation, it's possible to provide uh, improvement for marine species and communities that benefit from complex habitats. Based on the South Fork Wind Farm Construction Operation Plan, we're looking at about an acre of scour protection and material for each turbine. Uh, Andy mentioned 3,100 turbines for East Coast build out. So, you know, roughly 3,000 acres. That sounds really big, but, you know, this continental shelf is a really big place. Um, and in my geography in the mid-Atlantic, there's really no evidence that marine life populations are being limited by a shortage of relatively sandy, flat, muddy seafloor, which is ubiquitous on the shelf. Um, we have more than 3,000 acres just in New York designated as, as artificial reef habitat, for example, um, that, that's already been constructed. So, so I think I think this could really fall squarely in the category of net positive. I think it's not the only example of where there's opportunity, um, but one that I thought worth highlighting on this web. And um, uh, thank you for your time and there's my contact information. Thanks, Carl, that was great. Great perspectives on net positive opportunities. Um, so now we have some time for our Q&A session. So if each speaker could please turn their cameras back on, that would be great. Carl, you might be still sharing your screen. All right. I'll just <laughs> I mean, if you want Stop. to, that's okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Let me try. Stop sharing. How's that? Does that work? Yep. yep. That's awesome. perfect. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So our first question is for Justin, and it's a two-part question. So where in the project process do you see best management practices considered to preserve trust resources? And what could stakeholders do to help advance the integration of scientific information into such practices? 
Yeah, so the uh, for the first part, I, I covered that um, in quite a bit of detail um, earlier, uh, but the best management practices are, are considered throughout the process um, by both BOEM, uh, the developers, and, and all the agencies and, and stakeholders that are involved in the process that results in um, ultimately the, the issuance of, of the project uh, permits. But the, the final list of BMPs and, and mitigations that will be required are included as part of the environmental impact statement and uh, the project permits and approvals. Um, and the second, uh, second question was... Uh, yeah, what can stakeholders do to help advance the integration of scientific information into such BMPs? Right. So um, there are, with, with such a, a, a large scale undertaking and, and such a geographically vast uh, undertaking with, with offshore wind, there are a lot of stakeholders. Uh, and so um, I think the, uh, the, the most effective uh, coordination uh, that I've seen on, um, on, on pulling together scientific information and, and, um, and creating new scientific data uh, has been through two organizations, uh, and uh, these are these are plugs for the organizations. I don't do any work for them or have any uh, any stake in those. But uh, ROSA, the Responsible Offshore Science Alliance, uh, and RWSC, the uh, Regional Wildlife Science Collaborative, have both done a, an amazing job uh, coordinating with uh, all of the stakeholders to identify what the concerns are, um, to to figure out what the research initiatives should be. Uh, what sort of studies do we need to do? Where are the greatest impacts that, that we need to understand? What are the gaps in the data? Um, and, and who is best suited uh, to, to design and, and implement the studies uh, to, to be able to collect the data to, to answer those questions? So um, because of how many stakeholders there are, it really takes those types of organizations to, um, to, to integrate all the information and, and to coordinate the, you know, the, the research process. Yeah, that's a great point about collaboration, given the huge undertaking for offshore wind. All right. Well, thank you. Our next question is for Andy. While the offshore wind industry is growing rapidly in the U.S., as we've noted here, it's important to highlight that offshore wind is not new. Based on previous experiences in Europe over the past few decades and international scientific collaborations, what other considerations and efforts could be applied to advance scientific understanding of the interactions of offshore wind on the ecosystem? Um, I think you shared that question with me earlier, so it shouldn't be a surprise to me, but it is kind of a, a large question. Um, yeah, we have decades of experience. There was a great um, series of publications that was in the Journal of Oceanography uh, back in 2020. I think it's volume 33. It's the Interactions of Fisheries and Offshore Wind Energy. Uh, brought together a bunch of scientists from Europe and the U.S., and we published um, a number of those references that actually were in my presentation and uh, Justin and potentially Carl's as well. Um, and one of the takeaways uh, that we hear from Europe, and I remember like five years ago, one of the, I think it was, it wasn't, it was before they were Orsted, um, one of the de developers was on the panel, you know, the recommendation is don't do what we did in Europe, you know, get the science right. Um, you know, just an example um, of not getting the science right is really do go you know going it alone looking at just the project level or just the turbine level not linking projects to each other having um numerous different monitoring standards or protocols and not standardizing those approaches so i think we've all recognized that we need to do that we haven't corrected that yet for the us but we do but we do plan on doing that in our in, uh draft implementation strategy which we'll soon finalize we, we talk about an action to standardize some of the project level monitoring and that that will be it that will be a go a long way to addressing that big takeaway of getting the science right we've got decades of natural resource extraction industries across the us in order to meet our societal aims and in almost all cases we learn pretty hard lessons about not getting the science right or not totally thinking through our efforts um, um, on understanding interactions and eventually we pay these costs um, so thinking these things through up front is, is key. Some of those collaborations, uh, like through the International Council of the Exploration of Sea or ICES, where we're working um, with our colleagues uh, in, uh, actually across Europe, not just the North Sea now, because washer winter is happening, the Baltic, it's gonna be happening in the Med, 
that's happening in the Atlantic side um, as well is, is to collaborate with scientists who have performed um, and, and collaborated on, on efforts. You know, unfortunately, we, we do know a lot about the interactions of offshore wind energy on fisheries. Um, for the most part, there isn't a ton of studies in Europe on the interactions with marine mammals. Um, just because of the, the nature of, of those interactions. It's mostly uh, harbor porpoise. Um, and we have, you know, dozens of species just in the Northeast that we're going to have to address where there's, you know, we just have complete uncertainty on what these interactions are going to be. Um, so international collaboration is, is necessary. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of really great results coming out of Belgium, but that's just one country <laughs> out of many. Um, and so I think, I think, understanding uh, and designing monitoring and research programs uh, that um, are consistent, integrated, um, and regionally based is critical. The, 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 the impacts that we're going to see are, you know, are going to happen uh, at small to large scales. And the research and monitoring, if it's just project by project, which is sort of what's happening now to some degree, um, is gonna, we're going to have a hard time answering the questions that are important to us. Yeah, and it sounds like there's an overarching theme of collaboration, data sharing, um, so so that we can move forward and learn from any mistakes that were made in the past. Yeah, I think yeah, I think the positives collaboration, but also we need to stand. We need some requirements and standards. Currently, we don't have those. Definitely. Well, thank you. So our next question is for Carl. Examples of construction mitigation on the natural environment include implementation of gravity-based foundations to reduce noise impacts to marine life and avoiding sensitive habitats during cable route planning. And then I, I believe Justin also touched on a few more. What other design techniques do you think exist to reduce impacts to critical marine habitats? Um, yeah, Justin went through a pretty exhaustive uh, list and that's a good one for people who, uh, who are kind of coming back to this and looking at the slides. I think um in terms of reducing impacts in design you know for for the things that fly category that lighting is a is a real big one um basically reducing the lighting as much as possible in in that still allows for under the faa and, and u.s coast guard uh requirements for for lighting um quiet foundations that don't require pile driving your gravity-based foundations are just one of those um we haven't really seen um, that take off. I do. I do hope that there is life in um, in investments in that as the U.S. offshore wind industry um, continues to build out. Another one Justin mentioned is um, the offshore power station, offshore converter stations that um, uh, for for where that are using DC, where that where there has to be a conversion of AC to DC offshore, and then uh, as well as once once you get on land, they have to cool those. Um, cooling with um, ambient seawater um, it has potential impacts in terms of uh, entrainment, impingement, and uh, thermal pollution. And so uh, there's a, a, you know, technology that uses closed loop cooling, the way, you know, your car cools its engine with a closed coolant. Um, the, the, you know, those are just some examples of like design that could be that factored in. Yeah, I think that's great. I know uh, we covered quite a few different options during the presentations, but it's always good to hear different perspectives as well. So thank you. Um, so I'm going to throw a question to the group, uh, if that's okay, and then anyone can answer uh, as you see fit. So we're all aware of the tremendous efforts being taken on a national scale to preserve our natural environments. As we proceed with offshore wind development at such a large scale, what are the important aspects of monitoring and how do we establish metrics of success to protect the environment? Um, well, I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll start and briefly say that monitoring is really um, important. It's important to have a baseline. It's important to monitor with a design that you can not only understand before and after impacts, but understand the gradient of impacts that occur as you move distances. But what is, what's actually equally as important is the ability to learn from results and adjust where it's necessary and appropriate to do so. And so we know we're going to be building out projects um, really probably over a decade and a half or, or more. Um, 
And so there's so much lead time in, in these projects by the time they're permitted and by the time they start. And there, there, is, there is sort of a point of no return um, for any particular project. But how do we learn from one project in a way that we can uh, address potential changes of future projects before they hit that point of no return where the commitments are already made and the purchases are already made. And I, I think that's something that still quite needs to be worked out. Justin or Andy, do you wanna chime in? Yeah, I was just uh, thinking about the the point about standardization that that Andy made earlier. Um, I think that's that's critical because um, you just you can't um, you can't do such a large monitoring effort uh, with a single team or 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 in association with a single offshore wind farm. You you need to have everyone doing the monitoring and the data collection the same way uh, in order to um, to generalize results and data across. Um, across the larger ge geographic region. Uh, there needs to be that coordination um, the, among developers and among uh, the, the uh, natural resource agencies that are out there already doing monitoring like NIMS. Um, and um, I think data sharing is also uh, another, um, another important aspect of, of this whole thing. Um, you know, making sure the data are transparent and available to everyone to use. Uh, for for analysis and, and understanding. Yeah, thank you. I know we're uh, nearing the hour, but Andy, if you want to add anything to that last question. No, just I was, the only thing I was going to add, Justin Dot, which is sharing the data. Not all the data that's being collected right now in the U.S. is share is is shared. So we just highlight that. So like, I would let you go to some of the other questions. People have their hand up. Yeah, we're closing in on the end of the hour of the presentation, unfortunately. Um, so perhaps after the presentation, you can email um, any of the questions directly and um, touch base with our presenters. Um, but yeah, I want to thank everybody for attending today. I want to thank all three of our awesome experts and panelists. This was a phenomenal presentation and a great webinar. Um, the recording will be available on our website, so stay tuned for any announcements and then for any upcoming webinars that will be out as well. So yeah, thank you again for joining today. Thanks everyone.